We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you. you. may be seated. Thank you, Marilyn, for reading the scripture for us this morning. As I said, we've been using other people's requests, uh, what they wanted to hear about. And I've, you know, I've noticed how much of them have to do with relationships. And sometimes they might sound a little similar. We talked about loving God, about loving others. But somebody wanted a sermon about accepting other people who are maybe not easy to accept, or we maybe have a tendency to judge. And I preached a sermon about that not too terribly long ago when I talked about being unoffendable as Christians. But I wanted to go ahead and honor the request because I thought it was a good request. So we're going to talk today about accepting others. Let's bow one more time for prayer. Father, thank you for this moment and for your word that speaks to our hearts. May we open our hearts, our eyes, our minds, our ears to what you want to say to us, what you want us to see what you want us to understand, how you want to change our hearts from the inside. And we pray, Lord, we just lay our lives before you and let that happen. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's just be honest. It's, it's so easy to love some people, isn't it? We all know people who love us, who show us kindness, and it's easy for us to reciprocate. We, uh, we love them in return. But there's no grace, really, in that kind of love. In fact, Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. This is from the message, but I like the way it's so cut and dry. Here's what it says. Jesus talking. You're, you're familiar with the old written law. Love your friend and its unwritten companion. Hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. Jesus expects something more from us. The humorist Will Rogers, many of you will remember this, once said, I never met a man I didn't like. Well, I have to say, I don't think he's met some of the people I've met. <laughs> because they're, in honesty, if we're, there's a lot of hard-to-like people in the world. And by the way, I'm not thinking of anyone I've met since I moved to the Hill Country or became pastor of this church, okay? <laughs> but I don't have to tell you, there are some people who are just hard to get along with. And some of them are Christians. Disliking someone is taboo in our day, particularly for Christians. Well, maybe not as taboo as it used to be, but we preface our, as Christians it certainly is, and so we preface our list of criticisms with overtures of brotherly or sisterly love. Here's how we do it. I love so and so so much, but... Anytime you use the word but, it completely does away with everything that went before. And usually we say that because we don't want to be looked upon as being critical, but that's exactly what we're just about to do. And that helps us justify it. And people can do such annoying things and act in such inappropriate ways, at least to our way of thinking. Uh, here's the rock bottom truth. We live in a community with people. Some who are very different from us. And we are called 
to love them. And that can be a massive struggle at times. Because relationships are complex, not simple. And the more we get to know somebody, the more complex the relationship can become. And so we find ourselves drawn to some people, but really disliking others. Why is that? Well, here's a couple of things. Our dislike for someone may flow from their past acts of cruelty toward us. The people I have a hard time liking usually have wounded me through betrayal. Uh, Pardon me, just a minute. (laughs) Let me start again there with that point. Our dislike for someone may flow from their past acts of cruelty toward us. Uh, The people I have a hard time liking usually have wounded me through betrayal or insensitivity or behind-the-back slander. And that's happened to you, I'm sure, too. So the deeper the wound, the more intense negative feelings can boil up in me. So sometimes it's because something they did to me that makes me dislike them. But other times, our dislike of others reflects our own internal insecurities. We're threatened by those who have strengths where we are weak or are accomplished where we have failed. And so our dislike of people flows from our dislike, really, of ourselves. Now, I want to think about this. Can you think of one person right now who you find it very hard to love? Now, now really do this. In this moment, think of one person. Now, I'm not going to ask you for names or testimonies, okay? But I want to help you see something here. Now, you may be tempted to think of four or five people. Don't, don't do that. Just focus on one person. This person just rubbed you the wrong way. Maybe he or she was, uh, has wronged you in the past or hurt you. And so I'm just asking, are, does everybody have somebody in mind? Do you think of somebody right now? By the way, have you ever considered the fact that somebody might be thinking of you right now? <laughs> Hopefully not, just a thought. But here's what I want you to do. As you're thinking of that person, I want you to imagine Jesus Christ walking up to you and saying, I want you to love that person for my sake. What's your response? You may be thinking, but I don't feel like loving that person. Well, in the Scripture, in the Bible, love has very little to do with feeling. Of course, the feelings are nice if they're there. There is an emotional component to love, but primarily... Love is a choice, not a feeling. Christian psychologist Larry Crabb challenges us to see the good in people, including ourselves, buried beneath the pettiness and the selfish motivations that can irritate us so badly. Can we accept fellow Christians the way that Christ accepts us? What we just read about, forgiving each other, believing that there's something better That's exactly what Paul wrote in Romans, that last verse. Remember what it says. It says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So one big clue to accomplishing this type of love resides in how we view other people. Can we begin to look at others as Jesus in disguise. I mean, remember he said when we help other people in his name, we, uh, we do it unto him in Matthew 25. There was an American visitor who went to visit Mother Teresa in Calcutta just trying to look for the secret of how she did what she did, the fathom of her commitment to the outcasts in the streets and the slums of Calcutta. And how could she do that? And her reply corrected the person's vision. She said this, first we meditate on Jesus, then we go out and look for him in the skies. Seeing Jesus in people in need, the people around us, even the ones we dislike, are sons and daughters of God. They are fellow bearers of the image of God. I know, sometimes it's really hard to look at some people 
and see the family resemblance. But it's there. And that's why this perspective cannot be gained simply by an act of your will. Wanting to do better. Wanting to love more. Our hearts must be purposefully directed toward a vision of God and others and nurtured under the warm rays of God's grace for that to be a reality. So let's talk about how we apply that grace to people who are difficult to love. First one is grace applied to differences. You know, our default mode when it comes to other people is simple. You should be like me. Or if you're in a particular group, the message becomes you should be like us. We consider ourselves and our group normal the way people are supposed to be. Therefore, we judge people by how we would act or how we would think or how we would feel. So if people are not as we are, then there is something we think wrong with them. And grace reminds us that people are different in every conceivable way. There are extroverts and there are introverts. There are people who are are actually neat and organized. They make to-do lists. They could tell you their afternoon schedule for a week from Thursday. And at the end of the day, they fold their underwear. Then there are those who fly by the seat of their pants. They run late everywhere they go. They couldn't tell you what they're going to be doing tonight even. And in the morning, when they're getting dressed, they can't even find their underwear. So that's the difference between the two types of people. In case you're wondering which one of those two categories I mostly fit into, uh, there's a ceramic pen holder on my desk that says, organized people are just too lazy to look for things. So that's it. <laughs> Left to ourselves, we would consider other people's taste in music, and clothing, or decorating, just wrong. But by grace, we accept that differences are a reality of community. And we celebrate the diversity of God's creation. If we were all the same, a lot of us wouldn't be necessary, would, they? would we? <laughs> it's all those differences that really make life meaningful and beautiful. The second way is grace applied to weakness. Areas where a person struggles profoundly with key issues of life are not easy for others to take or understand if they don't struggle with the same thing. You spend an afternoon on a playground and you will quickly see that children naturally will pick on other children, maybe even revile other children for being overweight, or wearing braces, or wearing glasses, or having some kind of physical deformity, or wearing secondhand clothes, or for not being as bright or as pretty as some of the other children. The depravity of the human heart begins exhibiting itself at an early age. And as we get older, we no longer circle around at recess to taunt and tease others. Instead, We whisper our comments to others. Or we make snide remarks as they pass by and they can't hear what we're saying. We size people up. We form judgments. And in the end, we can, if we allow ourselves, condemn them for who they are. Particularly, notice this, when their weakness is one of our areas of strength. We want to emphasize the difference between their lives in our own lives. Somebody who's good with money has little patience or tolerance towards somebody who tends toward being a spendthrift. Somebody who's been naturally thin their entire life can be harsh and insensitive towards someone who has struggled with being overweight since childhood. We understand weakness in another person only if we share that same weakness. And what happens is We are prone to judge others harshly in areas where we are strong and let ourselves off the hook regarding our own weaknesses. It's like saying we want grace for ourselves, but judgment for others. 
But by grace, we understand that every human being is marked by weakness. By grace, we do not strike out at people for being weak. Instead, we wrap our arms around them in their weakness. The Apostle Paul counsels us in our attitude toward weakness. And that passage from Romans that we read, the very first verse of that passage said this, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. And that phrase in that verse, the, the words bear with, is not simply about putting up with somebody, tolerating somebody. It's about lovingly standing with them. Not just tolerating them, but putting your arms around them. Embracing them in the midst of their weakness. So grace for differences, grace for weakness when we're trying to learn how to accept others better. And then grace applied to sin. And of course, when we think of grace, here is the main application of grace. Grace is designed to be applied to sin. Even somebody else's sin. Even someone else's sin against me. Notice the verse there. Sin doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. Grace invites us into life. It's ironic that people who follow Christ can tend to forget grace sometimes and condemn people when we discover they've sinned. We sometimes treat offenders as if they should never be given another chance. As if they're no longer deserving of anything good and ought to be rejected. As if sin is somehow in a category beyond the application of grace. Or at least their particular sin, which doesn't happen to be the particular sin I struggle with. Our own sinfulness innate in every human being, means we are broken people. And sometimes our pride won't let us acknowledge our own brokenness. But it's there. I know my broken places. And I'm certain most of you know yours as well. That's why one of my favorite verses in the Bible has always been the one referencing God that says this, a bruised reed he will not break, and a flickering wick he will not put out. You ever felt like a bruised reed? Ready to break? Have you ever felt like your flame was about to snuff out? God's help and God's grace are always available to you in your birth. And just like it's available to you, it's available to every broken person. People who are called to accept. Remember this. It's for sin that Jesus died to extend grace so that we can love as we are called to love. The great Christian writer, author, thinker said this. C.S. Lewis, he said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable to love others means to love them in spite of differences to love them in spite of weaknesses and to love them in spite of the sins they have committed I remind you God loves you in spite of your imperfections God loves you in spite of your weaknesses God loves you in spite of your sin and your brokenness. And now all He asks from you is to share that same love He has so richly dispensed in your life with those around you. Accepting others. Even those, especially those who are very different from us. Love them no matter what. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the acceptance that we have found in You. The great gift of love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace that we 
are one of your children by faith, by putting our trust in you through what your son Jesus has done for us. And as we do that, Lord, help us to extend that same grace and not just a feeling of, but actually acting out and accepting others. Very different from who we are. Grew up differently. There's so many things, Lord, that we can point to that would divide us from each other. In You, it's where we find what binds us together. And help us not just to know that, but to practice that by accepting others. In the name of Your Son, Jesus, and for Your glory, that's what Paul said. That's how we can bring glory to You, by being loving and accepting people very different from us. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, Amen.